morning. It is Thursday, September 17th, 9 a.m. 2 a.m. This is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Um, we have uh, two things on the agenda for this morning. One was we make, making ourselves available in case there are any amendments being offered uh, um, before third reading on H96, the Act 50 bill. Um, and, uh, and then the second piece of business is we went through uh, H833 yesterday, the interbasin water um, bill yesterday, and asked for some edits to it and wanted to go through those today. And if we think everything's in order, <clears throat> um, vote that out and get it to the floor. Um, so I'm looking around the room, and at the moment, I, the one amendment that was, uh, that is in the Senate calendar is from Senator Benning, who emailed me last night and said he wasn't going to offer it. Um, and I said, well, it, it would be, <laughs> I would feel a little better if you showed up in committee to tell us it wasn't coming as opposed to me just saying, uh, I didn't wanna be sort of, uh, but he'll be, I think he's going to move to formally uh, withdraw that amendment before third reading. Um, so with that, yeah, Senator Rogers. So Senator Bray, um... I just forwarded um, our council a um, proposal. So, and I'd take the committee's uh, lead on this, but it, from what I understand, the anti-degradation uh, language that we put in a bill several years ago still hasn't been implemented. And I wondered if the committee would be interested in including that language in the bill. Um. Yeah, I would, you know, with, so I'll, let me ask what the, the rest of the committee thinks. Uh, I'll just <laughs> hold, hold my opinion, go last as moderator. You know. Senator McDonald, uh, what, would the, what would the impact be? And, you know, just when's the last time we've taken testimony on it? I, at first well, blush, it's already, it's already law. They just haven't implemented it. And I'm, I'm just, saying that if it's law they should have implemented it and I, I i'm just asking the committee if we're willing to put a thumb on them and say do it get it done it's law do we know why they haven't done it well we do have mr chapman here from anr i don't know if he's sort of ready to speak to that but I, he probably knows could fill us in a little bit uh and i ask because my first reaction is not to be opposed to it just to understanding the process and if it's needed yeah so i'm i'm not sure senator what senator rogers is, are you talking about uh adjusting or amending the date on uh the rulemaking as it relates to the anti-degradation implementation procedure yes that, okay uh, and and can i ask what the proposal is as far as an amended date well i or thought just, there I thought there was an existing date that hasn't been met. There and is. I, I, okay. And, and so I guess my question is, when are we planning on meeting that? And is there anything we can do to hurry the process along? So there's an existing um, anti-degradation implementation procedure that's not a rulemaking, but is a guidance document the agency follows when implementing the anti-degradation policy that is in the water quality standard. So there was a desire numerous years ago to have another rulemaking um, related to the implementation procedure. I don't think we're opposed to that in the large sort of a uh, set of rulemakings that are out there, it is it is not sort of come up to the top of priorities within the agency, appreciating that the legislature, uh, you should just, again, for context, we were prepared and started the rulemaking process in 20, I believe it was 2010. Then there was a, a, a legislative enactment that basically said you can't move forward with rulemaking. So we stopped the rulemaking process at that point. Um, I think it had to do with a change of administration that was about ready to take place at that time. And then there was, you know, there's basically been a pause and there hasn't been a lot of focus on it since then. I don't, I, I certainly don't think that there would be an objection to a change in the date to give 
some reasonable period of time, let's say two, two additional years um, from now for the agency to go through a rulemaking process and put a deadline on the agency to get the, the rule in place. I mean, I'd like to talk to folks back at the agency, but I know this is something we've we've talked about internally on several occasions to, to bring it up and try and get through it. It's, it's, it's complicated and there's a lot of people who have an interest in it, but I, we, it is on our radar and we know it's something that needs to get done. Uh, so Mike, if I could, Mr. Chair, ask Matt yeah. a couple more questions. So are permits being issued now in accordance with the law or how yeah, is that I mean, being handled? Sure. I mean, they're, they're being issued in accordance with both the anti-degradation policy and the water quality standards and the implementation procedure guidance documents that have been developed by the agency. Um, Mr. Chair, just um, Senator Bang is here. If he had a short right. communication to make to us, we might hear it. Yeah, thank you. I see he's in the room. Um, so we'll go back to our previously scheduled programming. Good morning, Senator Benning. Thank you for um, joining us. Good morning. Uh, we're, we convened our first order of business was is hearing any amendments, possible amendments for 926, which is up for third reading today. And um, I know you have an amendment on the calendar. I shared with the committee, I heard from you via email that you were considering with, you were planning to withdraw that amendment, but I was hoping you'd be here in person to talk to the committee rather than me speaking about emails and your intent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I apologize for being tardy to this meeting, but my, um, my office, my legal office took priority this morning. Um, I, do have a an amendment on the calendar which was basically asking to remove the um, sunset provision on the trails portion of the bill uh, after consideration in our discussion last night i have uh, come to the belief that that amendment probably will cause some heartburn on the other side of the building and uh, might actually lead to jeopardy of the bill in question. And it is very important for me and my constituents to have the trails portion of this bill go forward. So I'm withdrawing the amendment and it will not be presented on the floor today. Hope that takes care of that issue and thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, uh, thanks for coming in and letting us know in person. Um, yeah, and I'll speak for myself. If I'm back, I can, and I, I think this was a shared sense in the room. There's a very genuine interest in getting to a, a, a longer, more durable solution. Um, and I know that this is kind of a bridge solution. So uh, we'll all, I, I think people genuinely wanna um, do their best and we'll need more time, but there's, a, there's now a pathway to get there. So thank you for letting well, I, us know. I look no fun intended working with you yeah. all on that issue in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Ben. Mr. Chair, I want to apologize to Senator for Rogers for interrupting him to deal with No, deal with no it. apology yeah. necessary. That's that's sure. the way things roll. Thank you. Okay. Um, but it, so, uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. I, I totally understand that this may be too much for the committee to, to take up. It's late um, and all this, but as I understand it, uh, 10 VSA subsection 1251A C on or before July 1, 2016, the Secretary of Natural Resources shall adopt by rule or implementation process for the anti degradation policy and water quality standards of the state. The implementation process for the anti-degradation policy shall be consistent with the state water quality policies established in section 1250 of this title, the Vermont Water Quality Standards and any applicable requirements of the Federal Clean Water Act. The Secretary of Natural Resources shall apply the anti-degradation implementation policy to all new discharges that require a permit under this chapter. Um, and as I understand it, this is law and this has not uh, been carried out. Well, and the question I have too, how many permits have been issued since that time? Well, you maybe know, Mr. I, Chapman could, could answer no, that. I, I follow so, up because 
one of the frustration th things I hear from constituents is you guys aren't doing anything on water quality. We say we put these laws in place and we put money here and then we see, you know, we're four years behind the ball on this law. And, right. You know, we missed the deadline on the last administration with this one. So um, Senator McDonald, and then I'd like to add, check in with uh, Mr. O'Grady who's with us on the call. Um, Mr. Chair, the, you know, being four late, four years late is, is not appropriate. Um, you and I serve on the rules committee along with Senator Benning. One of the things that the rules committee can do on its own action is to call for the writing of rules to carry out statute. Um, that might be an avenue, but I would hope we would not. Um, we're put, put it on the bill that's uh, coming up today, so. Um, I, so Mr. O'Grady, you turned your video on. That's often a signal to me, I think, that you have something to share with us. Is there anything you want to contribute to the conversation? I, I turn my video on because I generally staff these issues and I, I just wanted to be available. I don't okay. want you to turn to Ellen. Um, not that she wouldn't be able to handle it, just that I usually staff these issues. Okay. Um, so. You know, I guess I, I appreciate Senator McDonald's point, you know, the LCAR, which is involved in rulemaking, can actually act on the question. Uh, another avenue to us, I don't know if it's, I think it's probably helpful in that it creates a little more um, momentum in the direction of getting a rule or final rule, is the this committee can send a letter uh, both to LCAR and to the agency um, you know, inquiring on the status of it and and urging completion. Um, I, so let me offer that as a, and and then the, the conversation is suggesting to me there's a lot more to the story, as Mr. Chapman said, and so that's my reluctance to and sort of ensnare the 926 in something that we really I'm feeling like, even though I've worked on this with all of you. I don't know enough to say oh, exactly how what we would ever say, even if we were leaning towards, you know, amending nine two six at this point. Yeah, well, I would be I would be happy, Mr. Chair, with with any movement. Um, if it's a letter from the committee, if it's Elcar taking over the reins, um, I just think that uh, something <clears throat> that was supposed to happen some years ago uh, should get some pressure. To be completed. Um, all right, so then I'll work with Mr. O'Grady to draft a letter and we'll um, write to both the agency and to LCAR to, um, since LCAR already has a mechanism under the Administrative Procedures Act to inquire about just such things um, and to urge completion of things. Um, Mr. Chap, can I ask one quick question? I know that you, uh, that agency is aware of this. Um, is, can you just describe what the most productive, so you're hearing this conversation, you know people would like to see the rule completed. Can you say anything about where we are now and what a productive next step is? Like, how would you proceed if you say, okay, we hear you, we wanna get, we'll get going on this, uh, moving up on the priority list. What happens next? Well, I think there's going to be, I, I mean, you know, the, the process of drafting a rule, I, I don't know whether it's useful or not, and whether the committee wants to take a trip through the land of anti-degradation, because you're right, Senator, it is more complicated than that. And I don't want the committee to be left with the impression that the agency's not implementing the anti-degradation policy. But I will say that there clearly is a procedural requirement to adopt rules that has not been met. So... Um, and to that end, I mean, I certainly have already have an email queued up to go out to inform the agency of the committee's interest with respect to this. I mean, the next step with respect to the agency is it, it's, there's an internal process uh, to basically take either our guidance, existing guidance document or develop a new document to it, you know, draft a rule. And then we begin both a pre rulemaking stakeholder comment and we start the rulemaking process. I mean, on average, a, 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 an uncontroversial rulemaking takes a year. Um, so that's normally the time frame. 
Sure. And can you just describe uh, what would be the sort of meaningful difference between, you already have guidance in place, we already have regular, it's not that this is unregulated, it's that the formal rule isn't been adopted. Can you say something about what out there in the real world, say this rule is completed, what happens with that rule that doesn't happen under the current regulatory scheme that you operate? I'm not sure that anything would change necessarily, and I say that in two fronts. One is there's been an anti-degradation policy, so a, a requirement that we look at sort of the impact of discharges on existing uses since the adoption of the water quality standards back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, there was a desire to have a, a more express implementation procedure a, a while ago. And um, we started through a, a more detailed anti-degradation implementation guideline to help the agency sort of work through some of the issues on implementation. Um, that's been in place and has been utilized since its adoption, you know, Again, I, I would like to say it's like, Mike, you may remember it's been 10 or 15 years ago at this point. Um, and then, uh, and we've been under a requirement for some time to uh, ch transition it to rules. I think it's speculative to me to say uh, whether the rulemaking process would yield a, an outcome that is different than our existing uh, guidance document. And I'm not for certain whether the agency in reviewing its existing guidance document might not decide to take a different approach, right? So I, that guidance document's been out there for a while. Um, and I'm certain that we've learned lessons along the way that might get incorporated into any ultimate rulemaking that, that we choose to do. Okay. And what's the relationship between the anti-degradation rule you have or, and uh, any kind of federal law? Uh, is the Clean Water Act, for instance, requires such a policy, and that's the basic driver for having an anti-degradation policy in law? So the Clean Water Act requires that state water quality standards have an anti-degradation policy. Okay. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. Senator Rogers? So um, I guess if we... <laughs> I have a, a, a couple issues. And number one, we've had several uh, departments and agencies over the years um, not meet the timelines that the legislature puts out. And, and that in and of itself is disturbing in the so much as we have just asked them uh, for a timeline on trails. And so with, a, with them not meeting timelines that we've laid out previously, it makes me a little bit nervous about if they're going to meet the timeline on these trails. And that's, that's point number one. Uh, point number two is if the uh, anti-degradation is being implemented just in a different way and not by uh, the rule that the legislature uh, asked them to come up with, then um, it seems that none of our waterways should be degrading, yet there is some evidence that there are still some waterways degrading. So I, I'm a little skeptical that, the, um, that, it, that it's being total, totally carried out in permitting at this point if we're seeing water quality still degrade in some areas. Could, could I, I, I just want to, the, the degradation policy that A&R has, there's three tiers, maybe even a fourth, yeah, and I can't remember. I think there's three though. Um, the most commonly used tier, what the agency is going to look at is whether the proposed use or proposed discharge is going to degrade any of the existing traditional uses of that water. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so you can have a discharge, you can have development, you can have growth, etc. If you implement measures that will, that will mitigate the effect of that new discharge on the, the traditional uses of the water. And therefore, the agency can determine that there won't be a degradation to the water. Now, some of the some of the the issues that are degrading the water, 
they they may have been there for for decades and Mm -hmm. you know i think one of the the most media friendly issues is the combined sewer overflows right you know those systems were designed by the romans right (laughs) right and and they work the way that they were designed to work it it it's just that we've determined now that that's not a great thing for our water quality and for our recreational uses. The anti-degradation policy may not have been in place when those were first designed or wasn't potentially not being implemented in the way that it is today when those were first designed and constructed. Um, There is a rule that that is designed to address them and, and get rid of them. Um, but it's going to take time and money. So there, there's, this is, this is a really, it's a, it's a, it has many moving parts. Uh, And so uh, I wish it was easier. And some people will argue that it is easier that the state just needs to take, take on the responsibility, but that really comes down to money. Um, and so that's that's up to you guys. That's what you do. Well, so quick question, Senator. So thank you, Mr. Hayes. It's helpful to be reminded. And when the anti day that you were talking about, so that, that's when we have is this I'm just trying to remember the system, class A, class B, B1, B2. You're basically not trying to let anything move down the ladder, right? You maintain where you are, or is it I'm, I'm seeing Mr. Chapman. Well, it, so this is this is I think the challenging part. So this is this is the use protection provisions of the the Clean Water Act designated in existing uses, right? And and existing uses are any use that's existed since basically the adoption of the Clean Water Act. Designated uses are the planning objectives that we have, uh, or I view them as basically the planning objectives that we've set for how waters should be. Um, and anti-degradation is, is really, it's, it, it's better to think of it as a use protection mechanism to make sure that waters that are high quality don't, don't impact any of those existing uses as opposed to sort of a, uh, some of our other tools to clean up impaired or, or degraded waters. We have, I think, uh, you know, and again, people can debate around this. I'm, I'm not certain that anti-degradation is necessarily the tool. It, it, it is a tool that we use with respect to new discharges. Um, it, even the language that Senator Rogers quoted is focused on new discharges as opposed to existing discharges. Um, so it, it's, it's a, and, and sort of that's where the, the focus has been. We've spent, as I know the committee knows, much of our effort on trying to take existing discharges and address some of the challenges that that are on the landscape based on our evolution of knowledge and how how these these discharges impact water quality okay and last question i think from me on this one is what's the relationship between the anti-degradation procedures or rules policy and non-point discharges because we've been doing a lot of work in recent years related to non-point discharges particularly around agriculture you know my my interpretation is is that the the anti-degradation and the discharge policy of the water quality standards apply to discharges and discharges generally speaking are point source discharges um, in, in other words, I'm, I'm not sure, and you probably need to talk to the Agency of Agriculture about how, with respect to non-point source discharges, they look at things like the discharge and anti-degradation policy. Okay. Um, the question I have for uh, Senator Rogers is, so you serve on institutions, which has the revolving loan fund where municipalities go to do things like wastewater treatment facility or sewer upgrades. You are, are those funds fully subscribed, you know, or what's your experience been in the last year or two in terms of people, the willingness basically of municipalities to take on some debt to do this kind of work? Um, those, those funds are, 
are generally all spoken for and used up and it seems like all the municipalities are willing to do what there's money for and we know they're expensive projects and that it takes uh, some number of years to plan and 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 do the actual construction because they're under city roads and stuff but yeah um there's never enough money that's money always seems to be the problem or a, a significant portion of the problem is money okay um well with that any so thank you for bringing up anti deg senator rogers uh i'm sure somewhere right now a former committee member chair snelling is having a good feeling and she doesn't know why but it's because you're carrying the anti deg yeah. flag forward um so we'll i'll work with mr o'grady bring back a letter to the committee for review and sign off um and i think we can probably do that uh either in the next day or two or by the beginning of next week I, i'm not sure what mr o'grady's schedule is like i know it gets busier by the minute this time of year okay great thank you thank you um okay so we don't, there's no one else who has shown up that I believe, well, let me check in. There's um, Mr. Coleman's here, Mr. Fidel is here. Um, I don't know if you're appearing because of Senator Benning's amendment that he's chosen to withdraw on, or if there's any other amendments in play that we should be aware of. Senator Bray, I was just here in, in response to the invitation related to the, the Benning amendment. Okay, thank you for uh, coming in. Good morning, Mr. Coleman. Hey, good morning. Um, same here. Uh, and unfortunately, I know more about anti-deg than I'd care to admit, and I will stay out of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> stay out of that discussion, for, and uh, put that on the back burner for a future a future day. All right. All right. Okay. Um, so with that, then I think we're finished on topic one. Uh, 926 amendments and uh, go to uh, 833. Um, Mr. O'Grady, you put together an amendment on 833. Could you um, walk us through the amendment and then we'll have some discussion and perhaps we vote it out? Sure, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I, I don't have host capability or co-host capability. Um, uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, here we go. Okay, now let me try. All right. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. All right, so this is the amendment you requested to 833. The first instance of amendment would uh, amend subdivision three in the duties that the study group would have. They are going to identify whether the state of Vermont should develop and implement the statewide permitting or other regulatory regime for diversions or other transfers to surface water, including the scale or size of a watershed subject to regulation, how a permitting program will comply with the Vermont water quality standards, how or if the pro permitting program should address the impact of a diversion on groundwater and how to address reducing the demands for water through water recycling, reuse and efficiency measures. Should I move on? Great, I think that those were the extra considerations we hope they would put on the table. Thank you. Okay, the next instance of amendment uh, addresses the date of the report of the study group, moving it from January 15, 2021 to December 15, 2021. And similarly in the third instance of amendment addressing when the, the study group would terminate, moving it from February 1, 2021 to February 1, 2022. So that is uh, the end of the amendments to the underlying 833 bill that came over from the house. Okay. Um, that takes you then to the fourth instance of amendment. What you do is you strike out the effective date of 833 and you add a new section. This is relating to the financial surety provision for holding tanks in 10 VSA 1979. You'll see as you requested that the entire 
um, requirement for financial surety for anyone receiving a holding tank under section 1979 uh, would be struck. I wanna clarify that this is not a requirement. Financial surety is currently not a requirement for the best fix standard. So if a residential home, their system fails and holding tank is the best fix, they're currently not required to have a bond, et cetera. Um, so this doesn't affect the residential user. This affects the, the public buildings and the nonprofit charitable, et cetera, that qualify for a holding tank under 1979. They will no longer have to post that bond. And then there's a subsequent conforming amendment on lines nine and 10 in subdivision 3B. And then the, the act takes effect on passage and that is the amendment. All right. Um, any committee questions for Mr. O'Grady? All right. Thank you, Mr. O'Grady. Looks great. Um, if there's no questions for Mr. O'Grady, I'm wondering if the committee is ready to uh, vote on vote to amend 833, Mr. Uh, Senator Parent. I, I couldn't make the testimony with ag. Can you just give me a brief uh, description of you know what the problem we're trying to solve here is and you know what what brought this about? Um, I don't have any. Uh, the holding tank language. Um, yeah. So uh, a few years ago, someone donated money to the Addison County Field and Fair Days to um, build a welcome center. Uh, when mm -hmm. they built that welcome center, uh, certain wastewater requirements were triggered for a permit. Um, to do what's required under the rules for a, like a mound system, et cetera, it would have been very, very expensive. So two years ago, you amended the holding tank law to make um, events, nonprofit events that are uh, held for no more than 28 days a year, um, eligible to use a holding tank. And the Addison County Field and Fair Days applied to the agency for that holding tank permit and they got that holding tank permit. Part of the permit was to put in a temporary tank and then do some flow monitoring to see if they would need a bigger tank. It turns out they need a bigger tank and as part of their overall permit, whether or not it was the temporary tank or the, the permanent tank, they have this financial surety requirement under 1979 but it's very difficult to get a bond for a holding tank, regardless of if you're Addison County Fair or, or anyone else. And so the agency has proposed eliminating that requirement. There is still a provision in 1979 that requires anyone that gets a permit under that section to have a, a contract with, an, with a current um, septic tank pump company so that there is continued maintenance of that holding tank so that there isn't an issue with its, its operation or its overflowing, failing, et cetera. So, okay. and the permit itself will have conditions on it for maintenance, et cetera. So by removing the financial surety provision, you take away uh, a potential burden, obstacle, for nonprofits, public buildings, municipal government to get a holding tank while still retaining under the permit and the remaining issue provisions of 1979 control and surety of the maintenance and operation of the tank. Okay, right. thanks. Thank you. Um, if I was good at memorizing, I would put that in my head and be bring it to the floor if asked. <laughs> the, other, the other piece too from the, the board that runs the field day's point of view was the cost of that bond was you know, considerable. And they, because uh, all the fairs run under some financial pressure and this year, especially with having to not have even hold field days um, it just helps them have a little more money on hand to go ahead and do the tank replacement. And the timeliness issue was while they're not really doing much over there these days, there's an opportunity to 
do the construction this fall um, and be ready for next operating season. Yep, at least that makes sense. Okay, all right. Um, so with that, I um, wonder if there's a motion to amend H33 as in the amendment Mr. O'Grady just walked us through. Uh, Senator Bray, just, I, I guess, just one quick um, comment, I guess. Um, I, I don't really have a issue with the um, bill as proposed in and of itself, but as, as with many other things that we ask agencies to, to look into, um, I do have some concern that there's going to be a, a substantial effect on agriculture um, because a lot of folks that grow things, hemp being one of them, but you know, live, livestock and a lot of other stuff um, do use surface water. And I'm, I'm just concerned as always that somebody will come back with a plan to add more cost and, and more regulation to an already struggling sector. So that does give me uh, some pause on the, on the underlying bill. Just wanted to make that point. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, well, I, you know, from, I, under, I understand that and I'm trying to remember the, I don't know enough about this topic. There is sort of a privileged position, isn't there, Mr. O'Grady, in law in terms of water withdrawals for agriculture or is that not true? Um. So agriculture is actually a protected use of waters under the water quality standards. Um, but to back up, you don't potentially don't even get to that because most irrigation in Vermont, farmers are using groundwater wells and not surface water diversion for, for their water. So you, you wouldn't put, most farms currently aren't gonna trigger th that issue. Um, with that said, Senator Rogers mentioned hemp. Hemp cultivation is, is, a, is a heavily water dependent crop from my understanding. Um, and there might be, if the industry grows or if cannabis, outdoor cannabis uh, cultivation grows, uh, there, might, there might be some farmers that look to, to surface water for irrigation. Uh, in, in many states, that, that type of, of irrigation is either protected, if you're like out in the West and you have the protected water rights, but we're in the East where surface water diversion statutes usually have some sort of either lower threshold or exemption for agriculture. I, I, I think that that's part of what the study group is gonna look at and make a recommendation on. You ultimately as the body are gonna be the ones to decide whether or not agriculture would be subject to a diversion permitting system or not. Um, but I, I think for the most part right now, most farmers get their water from the ground uh, and are exempt from the large volume groundwater permit uh, by statute. So I think most farmers aren't gonna be affected immediately into the future with cultivation of water dependent crops, maybe it, it becomes an issue, but that's something that you can address in any statutory scheme that you create. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Rogers, you know a lot about hemp cultivation. So do you, do you do like drip line irrigation or do you um, just depend on the weather? We do some of both. We do some drip line and some that's subject to the whims of mother nature. Uh -huh. Okay. And, and that's the, the, one of the reasons I asked is because I don't think Senate Ag has, has weighed in on the bill or I'm not sure how much they know about it or if they would want to dig into it. So that does concern me a bit. And as I said, we're in the 11th hour here, so. I think, I mean, from my point of view, since it's a report to get us started to put the next legislature to actually be the legislative session of 2022, right, into a position to be better informed to follow up. So, and did we get a cost on uh, what what the projected cost of this? 
Uh, they, they're, I, I, um, I forget. No, I didn't ask for a, a fiscal note. I could do that. I've, there are up to six meetings allowed and limited number of people who are eligible for per diems. Um, I'll ask um, JFO. I think that, you know, pretty much they have a recipe for X number of meetings, X number of people leads to how much cost. My guess is it's probably 2000 or less. But I'll ask for a note. Mr. Okay, Grady, you've, been, you've been through this before with with work groups and approps. Um, do you happen to have any knowledge, or want me to just go to JFO and ask them? Uh, I don't have any specific. I I would have said two thousand dollars. You've got eight people that uh, potentially qualify for the per diem and expenses. And from my experience in the past, that, that's basically a $2,000 cost for six meetings. Just thinking back to the wetland study group, for instance, there were six legislators, there were six to eight meetings, and it would cost out at, at $2,000. So you're, you're, in that, you're in that ballpark. Okay, not big money then. Right. Right. Um, Senator Rogers, do you want me to formalize that with JFO or is that... No, not necessarily. I was just looking for a ballpark personally. Okay. All right. Um, if there's nothing else, um, looking for someone to make a motion to amend 833 as presented in the amendment, Mr. O'Grady just walked through. Anyone ready to make that motion? <laughs> I'll move. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Perrin. All right, right. So the chair doesn't make motions. <laughs> um, so with that, all those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Okay. So the, the committee vote is 401 to amend the bill. And I'll be looking for a motion to move 833 as so amended. So moved. Thank you, Senator Rogers. All those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. So four, zero, one. Senator Rogers, I see you moving your hat. That's usually the signal you'd like to report this bill. <laughs> I'm just scratching my head. <laughs> right. uh, anyone, I'm happy to report the bill if no one is uh, anchoring to do that. Okay. Seeing no, no takers, 401. Um, so uh, Mr. O'Grady, do you, do we, can you, since we do this thing a little differently in the electronic age, the Zoom era, you send both the amendment and the base bill to the secretary, is that right? Um, or do I think I, you send them to me and I send them directly to the Senate. Right. I think that that's what the Senate secretary yeah. prefers. He prefers to get it directly from one okay. of the senators. All right. So I'll watch for the base bill and the amendment, and then I'll send them on with a committee report. I um, have no changes to the amendment, so I will just resend what I've sent previously. Great. Um, thank you very much. And um, so let me check in with Senator Parent as a, a sort of a for floor work, I'm just looking ahead. The, the time is running short. Would you be willing to approach the um, uh, minority party and see if they might be willing to expedite floor work on the bill? I have not checked with the majority leader, but I'm just asking that question ahead of time. What's bill? On 833, the okay. water. Yeah, I'll check with Jeff. Okay, thank you. And I'll check with Senator Bell. Um, okay, anything else anyone wants to bring up? All right. So thank you everyone. Uh, that completes our work for today. Um, I do have a question about one other bill that is in the in basket. You know, we don't usually meet as a morning committee this far, this close to adjournment. Um, is there an appetite on the committee's part to look into a tree warden's bill that is in our in-basket? I think there is 
more controversy attached to that than you know this report on water. So I'm I'm game for doing that, but I also want to respect people's schedules and frankly the fact that we've been going at it week after week for, for a long time now and we're closing in on adjournment. So any, well, any thoughts? I, I have I have heard from some of my constituents about the long overdue need to address it. And I'm probably the one that has the least amount of uh, flex time at this point. Um, I don't know where the controversy's coming from. I haven't heard any opposition uh, from my perspective, but I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in committee, it, but it, it does seem long overdue. Okay. Any other, um, so how about this? I'll, I'll um, send the bill out to everyone. Maybe people could give it a read through um, and, um, and just take a look and I'll, I'll follow up with, well, so let's do this. Tomorrow is Friday. Um, I'll let people know if uh, we're gonna try to meet tomorrow and maybe just get a bill introduction. That might be a, a way for us to size up how, uh, achievable it is with the time we have left. Does that sound like a decent approach? Yeah. Do a bill walkthrough and then we'll know what we're talking about. Um, Mr. O'Grady, were you the drafter for for that or no, somebody else? I was not, uh, Tucker Anderson was the drafter. Oh, that's right, thank you. Okay, so great. Then planning wise, we'll, we'll have our regular nine o'clock start time tomorrow. I'll see if we can get, um, uh, Mr. Anderson to come in and uh, we could do uh, initial tee it up, walk through, size it up and see if um, it feels like something we could work through, you know, responsibly work through with the limited time we have left. Um, you know, and Senator Rogers on the controversy side, I'm, I think some of what is coloring my memory on this is because over here in Addison County, there was a case that was pretty high profile and prolonged uh, some struggle related to um, trees being cut and conflict between the landowner and the municipality where the cutting was happening. Uh huh. So, right. Great. Do we have any idea when? I know the budget's going to be on the floor today. So, do we have any idea when we're done? 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 Um, the hard stop I heard was next Friday, a week from tomorrow. Friday. God willing, it's next Tuesday. <laughs> well, okay. that's, yeah, so let's take a look. I mean, that's what I don't want to do is have us jump in. Yes, know, and, and not then reach the finish line. Budget, the budget's done, we go home and yep. we've been churning away for two meetings and can't get anywhere. So I'm gonna, that's, that's a good point. I'm going to double check the calendar so we don't start down a road that we can't you know, complete. Uh, but meanwhile, I'll also see if we can just get the bill teed up tomorrow morning. All right. So thank you, everyone. Uh, see you on the floor at, well, there's a, a caucus on budget, uh, all Senate caucus at noon, and then we're on the floor at one. Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Yeah. Are you, you just said you'll see us on the floor, and I was looking at a digger story this morning, which showed a picture of you and the caption was that you were presenting the um a bill on the floor <laughs> of the center i noticed uh, that it was a little strange so um so perhaps we will see each other on zoom where we conduct legislative business later today <laughs> yes well it was pretty odd to see that picture and and then in the text it says they did this work via you know a zoom session so uh, yeah. I'm probably confused more than one person. All right. Uh, see you at noon and then again at one. Thank you. And we are finished for the day.